All right, it is two o'clock. So again, even though it's, it's Tisha B'Av, we'll welcome everybody and uh, look forward to learning with Dr. Lakshin, who of course is no stranger to uh, anybody from Toronto, no stranger to lots of you, no strangers to our, our Zoom learning. He's been giving a couple of series and it's a pleasure always learning with him. And he'll be speaking today on, on poetry. You see it up on the screen, Poetry, History and Lament. He was a longtime professor, now Professor Meredith at York University. He learned many years ago and Merkaz HaRav Kook uh, and Dr. Mursky's talk, of course, on Rav Kook. And I didn't realize the connection to Dr. Elif's lecture is that Dr. Mursky's grandfather, who was a great scholar, great Hebrew scholar, um, was one of the founders of Kav Masatu. So everything all connects. Kola Torah Kula Inyan Achad, as the Gemara said. It's all one topic. So, Bakasha, Dr. Lakshin, it's all yours. Thank you very much. I imagine that there weren't too many of you who were in a shul this morning. First of all, there weren't too many who were in shul at all this morning. And those of you who were in shul this morning probably did not get a full uh, set of keynote recited. Even the chief rabbi here in Israel ruled, the Ashkenazic chief rabbi said that everybody should recite three keynotes. But if you have, ever, if you have some memories of Tisha B'Av uh, past, I'm sure you remember sitting in sh some shuls for a very long time. And uh, uh, such a large amount of literature has collected uh, poetry that is trying to come to grips with the destruction of the Second Temple and with the dispersion of the Jews uh, throughout the world. Uh, I'm sure you all know that the, keynote, that the keynote collections that we use have grown over the years and now also include keynote for various medieval uh, uh, tragedies such as the uh, destruction of Jewish communities uh, by crusaders in, in Germany uh, in, at the end of the 11th century or the uh, burning of the Talmud in Paris uh, in the 13th century. And of course, uh, almost any synagogue that you would go to today has added at least one kina for the Holocaust. But what I want to talk about today is particularly the keynote that uh, the largest number of keynote, which actually are about the, uh, the, the destruction of the temple and the dispersion of the Jews throughout the world. So this, this corpus grew uh, very quickly, but I'd just like to begin by posing the question, which I, 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 I'll, I want to tell you beforehand, before I pose this question, I don't really have an answer for this question, but uh, a question that was posed by Professor Shia Cohen in an article uh, that he wrote a number of years ago called From Scripture to Midrash. And here's a, a, a selection from this article and with the question that Professor Cohen poses. In a period of less than 70 years, the Jews of antiquity lost three major wars. The Great Revolt of 66 to 74 CE, the uprising of the Jews of Cyrenaica, Egypt and Cyprus in 115 to 117 CE, and the Bar Kokhba Rebellion of 132 to 135 CE. Each of these conflicts caused enormous losses of life. If we may believe our sources, over 1,400,000 dead and property, and each had a major impact on Jewish history. In 70 CE, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, thereby radically altering the map of Judaism. No longer did Judaism have a sacred center, a temple, a priesthood, and a sacrificial cult. The War of 115 to 117 CE marked the final eclipse of the golden age of Alexandrian Jewry. It's a period of history that we don't know that much uh, about, but there was a thriving Jewish community in Alex, a, a Greek-speaking Jewish community in Alexandria and in other places. To punish the Jews for the Bar Kokhba insurrection, the Romans renamed the land of Israel, Syria, Palestina, forbade Jews to dwell in Jerusalem, now a pagan city, and proscribed the practice of Judaism for several years. What was the reaction of the rabbis to these cat catastrophes? That's a great question. Okay, and then uh, a couple of hours ago, I guess three hours ago now, I was just listening to a lecture given by Professor Jonathan Price of Tel Aviv University. It was through the auspices of the uh, National Library. Of course, the only way you listen to a lecture these days is by Zoom. Uh, and uh, 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 Professor Price was talking about the great 
amount of Jewish literature that actually does deal with this, uh, with this destruction that, that was written right afterwards in books that most of us haven't even opened at any point in our life. Books like Fourth Ezra, Second Baruch, Third Baruch, and the Apocalypse of, of Abraham books. Some of them are in the Apocrypha. Some of them didn't even make it into the Apocrypha. Books written by Jews in, 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 uh, in Hebrew or in Greek that were trying to deal with this tragedy. But what was the reaction of the rabbis to these catastrophes? So Professor Cohen has this surprising claim here. At first, there was near silence. The rabbis of the Tanaitic period from 70 to 200 CE, after the destruction, until the end of the time of the Tanaim in 200 CE, did not write laments or seek refuge in apocalyptic dreams. They did not establish new fast days. Let's think how many fast days we have. We have four fast days that are connected to the destruction of the, uh, of the first temple, and we have no new fast days for the destruction of the second temple. Nor did they accord a place in their curriculum to the study of these momentous events. While Tanaitic corpora, the, the collections, allude frequently to the destruction of the temple, they mention Beitar, the site of Bar Kokhba's last stand, only once. They never mention the names of the leaders of the wars of 66 or 115 or 132. They never mention Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai's alleged role in the drama of the Great Revolt or Rabbi Akiva's alleged endorsement of the messianic claims of Bar Kokhba. They seldom mention the Roman emperors who opposed, opposed, oppressed the Jews. We find later Jewish literature, we find the later the literature of the Amoraim is filled with discussions of these issues. And of course, the poetry that develops into the keynote is filled with the discussion of this, these issues. But the rabbis, of the, the Tanaim, if they address these issues, nothing that they said about it has lasted. And since we have collections, uh, some very good Tanaitic collections, it would seem like they didn't address it. And he writes, the nature of this Tanaitic silence is not clear. Was it silence engendered by shock and despair, not knowing what to say in the face of catastrophe? The rabbi said nothing. Or was it silence engendered by determination? I don't know if this is a convincing argument, but I like this idea. Ignoring the harsh political realities, the rabbis devoted their energies to creating a religious system which would ensure the survival of Judaism. However interpreted, the fact remains that the Tanaim did not tell stories or preach sermons about the military disasters of their era. Instead, they busied themselves with the production of books of law and exegesis, interpretation. The study of history had to wait. So these, these were crucial things in the history of Judaism. Now, what do we find that the Tanaim were doing? They were creating a new kind of Judaism. They were moving to Yavna. They were creating a uh, cre creating rabbinic uh, Judaism, creating a, a, a Judaism that would survive without having a temple at its center. But they weren't writing poetry or other works that were that were addressing this problem. As the years went on, the rabbis did start doing this. And for the most part, when they did this, they modern, modeled themselves on the book, the book that, that's in the Tanakh that is dealing with the issue of, uh, of destruction. Uh, and, and, and that is the book of Echa, which is written after the destruction of the first temple. Was it written immediately or was it written a number of years later? Uh, Traditionally, it's understood that it was written pretty well right away, and it's often attributed to, to uh, Yirmiyahu. You heard, uh, some of you may have heard the brilliant lecture that uh, uh, R Rabbi Dr. Berman gave about Echa a few days ago as part of the series of uh, 24 lectures about the 24 books of the, uh, uh, of the Tanakh. And it sounds like Rabbi Berman is convinced that Yirmiyahu did write it. Uh, there are some people who say that you know at the end of the uh, at the end of Echa when it says Lama la netzach why why are you going to forget uh, uh, abandon us and forget about us forever la, la, la netzach the, uh, the, 
that it, it's hard to say that that line was written immediately after the destruction of the temple. Would they be saying, Lama la netzach tishkachenu, right away? It might be. Um, and as I said, some of you heard uh, Rabbi Berman's uh, suggestions about Echa. I'll tell you, I'm, uh, uh, I learned a lot from Rabbi Berman, but I'm, I'm actually more attracted to the, uh, the theory here of Yael Ziegler in an article that's coming out in, uh, in the next edition of Tradition and that was just sent out. So in the beginning of the article, she writes, the book of Echa describes the destruction of Jerusalem without providing consolation, clear theological explanations or guidelines for national rehabilitation. Instead, it presents an evocative and painful account of suffering. But the book of Eicha is not trying to answer the question of why. It's not providing a clear theological explanation. It's not providing consolation particularly. It's not saying, well, what should we do now to rebuild? What it is doing, it is, it is describing the pain. And much of the literature of the keynote, not all of it, but much of the literature of the keynote is an attempt to describe the pain. The, uh, let's, let's just say something before we go on to, uh, to the keynote. Let's say something about the structure of Echa. Uh, uh, Rabbi Berman al alluded to this in his uh, lecture on Tuesday. Uh, chapter one consists of 22 verses with an alphabetical acrostic. Chapter two, 22 verses, alphabetical acrostic. I'm sure you all know there are 22 letters in the Hebrew uh, alphabet. Chapter three, 66 verses, which is a triple alphabetical acrostic. Chapter four, 22 verses with an alphabetical acrostic. Chapter five, curiously, 22 verses, but no alphabetical acrostic. Uh, why do people write in alphabetical acrostics? It's, first of all, it's easier to remember with your, when you're memorizing a text, but there's also a, a feeling that when, when you are, are trying to express a deep emotion and you, 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 you express it with the letter Aleph and then with the letter Bet and with the letter Gimel, you're showing how, how, how deep and how pervasive this, uh, uh, this emotion is. Okay, so this is the model that people had when they were writing keynotes, because they were thinking that the rabbis also referred to, uh, to the book of Echa, as Rabbi Berman mentioned, as a Sefer Keynote. They call it a book of keynotes. So when they started to write keynotes, they were modeling themselves on, this, uh, on the model of Echa. Now, the, uh, the most famous writer of keynote was uh, uh, Rabbi Elazar HaKalir, about whom uh, there are so many theories about when he lived and, uh, and who he was. There are people who argue that he was w back in the second century, but in the scholarly community, that is not uh, an accepted uh, suggestion. The, the more co most common belief in the scholarly community is that Rabbi Elazar HaKalir lived here in Eretz Yisrael sometime between the sixth and the eighth century, there are many allusions in his poetry to books that were written in the times of the Amoraim, to literature of the Amoraim. And so that's why the, the common belief is that he uh, w was uh, immediately at, at, towards the end of or immediately after the Amoraic period in the sixth to the eighth uh, century. Uh, he was a brilliant masterful poem and the poet uh, and just like looking at this first this is what when you open up the keynote for Tisha B'Av uh, morning here's the first kina that you have here and you see uh, his uh, virtuosity here you see uh, see all these Samach verses for, for some reason that, uh, that, that I've never seen a decent explanation of this uh, Elazar Khalir's poem that we call Shabbat Suru actually is a full alphabetical acrostic, but whoever put together the collection of the keynote just decided to use from the letter Samach to the letter Taf. And we have the rest of the poem. You can find it in, in Goldschmidt's uh, scholarly edition of the keynote, but we start in the middle of this poem with the letter Samach. So you see here we have six Samach verses 
Suru, Sri, Sakota, Sakota, Safku, and Sila. And Suru is the word that's used for the Samach verse in chapter 4 of Eicha. And then Sri, Sakota, and Sakota are the three Samach verse, the three words of the three leading words of the three Samach verses in chapter 3. And then Safku is the Samach word from chapter 2. And then Sila is the chapter, is the Samach word from chapter 1. So he's getting across this impression that the world has been turned upside down. And if you hadn't guessed, the word Shavat is actually the equivalent of the Samach word in uh, so, so Samach is which letter of the Hebrew alphabet? It's uh, the 17th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. If, uh, or, uh, 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 whatever it is, that is the equivalent in chapter 5, which has 22 verses, but doesn't have an alphabetical uh, acrostic. And so he did this throughout this poem, and he worked into each of the 22 stanzas of this poem a word that, has to, that recalls the name of one of the mishmarot, one of the watches of the Kohanim. There were 24 watches, 24 mishmarot of, the, uh, of priests in the temple, and that's one of the reasons why people say that Elazar Kalir must have been relatively early in writing because he's still thinking about these mishmarot of Kohanim that don't exist anymore and the sadness that, these, uh, that, that, that we don't have these Kohanim anymore. But these are extremely difficult poems to understand. And just, just to get across how difficult this is, I, I've given you here, this is for the second last, the 21st of the 22 stanzas of this poem, Shabbat Asuru. I've given you two English translations of it side by side. So you can see that when you're reading the Hebrew, sometimes you don't know what he's saying at all. Like, and I highlighted in blue here, you know, may those who exiled me hear that their joy is but temporary. That's the Korean translation of the first line of this, uh, of this stanza. And the Rosenfield translation is, bring us back and fulfill the proclamation, rejoice. Which one is it? Uh, the line five here, we dug holes in the earth in which to cook and thus broke our teeth on stones. Is the Korean translation, the Rosenfield uh, translation. And when my people lay down or wandered forth, they fed me with gravel. So what are they doing? Are they digging holes in the earth to cook? Or are they lying down and wandering forth? It's such difficult Hebrew that it's, uh, it, 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 it's a great challenge. And uh, whoever decided to make this the first kina in the printed selection of kinot made it, made it so difficult for us to start the process of, uh, of reciting kinot because you're, uh, you feel like a failure right away when you start reading this. Avraham Ibn Ezra, Abraham Ibn Ezra in the 12th century in his commentary on this verse in Kohelet, Al Tevahel Al Picha, keep your mouth from being rash. Let not your throat be quick to bring forth speech before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. That is why your words should be few. Uh, <laughs> in a verse that says, your words should be few, Abraham Ibn Ezra wrote one of the longest comments that he has on any verse in the, uh, uh, in the Bible. And the comment, uh, I've just given you the highlights of the comment uh, here of Ibn Ezra on that verse in Kohelet, where he says, Yesh bepiutei Rabbi Eliezer kalir menuchato kavod arba dvarim kashim. The poems of Rabbi Eliezer kalir may he rest in peace, present four major problems. One, most of his piyutim consist of riddles and parables. They're difficult to understand. Uh, it's, this might be a little bit of a case of the pot calling the kettle black because Ibn Ezra also occasionally himself writes in riddles and parables, but he thinks that Rabbi Al-Azhar Kalir has overdone it. 
Second of all, his poems contain Talmudic terminology. It is well known that there are many words in the Talmud that are not in the holy tongue. They're not in biblical Hebrew. Now the rabbi said the language of scripture stands by itself. The language of Talmud stands by itself. Who brought this disaster upon us of praying in foreign languages? And even Ezra is right that most of our prayer book is written in biblical Hebrew. Somebody who understands biblical Hebrew, first of all, many of our prayers are straight out of the Bible. And even the ones that were written afterwards are written in words that you can find in biblical Hebrew. Even Ezra goes on, problem number three, even the words that are in the holy tongue in the poems of Kalir contain major mistakes. Uh, Kalir allowed himself latitude. He, you know, if if there was a verb that normally shows up in PL and it would work better with the meter if he put it in he feel, he put it in he feel. And, 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 and uh, even Ezra gives in this, uh, as I said, I just made this comment a lot shorter than it is, but even Ezra gives many examples of ways that Kalir was in, according to strict rules of grammar, uh, Go, uh, breaking the rules of Hebrew grammar. And number four, all of Rabbi Elazar's piyutim are filled with midrash and agadot. However, our rabbis taught a verse never departs from its plain meaning. This being so, people should employ only pshat when they pray. Uh, it's an amazing comment of Ibn Ezra that pshat is not only the uh, correct way to interpret the, uh, the Torah, it is also the way you should pray using pshat. When you, when you allude to a biblical verse, it shouldn't be to a midrashic interpretation. Uh, they shouldn't say uh, prayers that can be interpreted in many ways, it, like quoting a verse and then expecting that the readers will know what the midrash is about this uh, verse. The Ibn Ezra says that is the problem. So, that's the criticism of Kalir, but I decided that uh, uh, in the time that I had uh, today, I would like to try to say something in defense of some of the poems of Kalir, and I'd like to look at some of the other poems of Kalir that are, I think, a little easier to understand than the first one that, uh, that we looked at at Shabbat. Suru many. Oh, just, I'm sorry, the last comment of Ibn Ezra here. I cannot explain even one out of a thousand of the errors made by the Paitanim. In my opinion, people shouldn't employ these poems in their prayers. They should pray using the fixed liturgy. We should keep our words to a minimum. ma'atim. Just a tfilak, fuah. Don't add any of these piyutim. Jewish history did not listen to Ibn Ezra. Okay, so here is a, another masterful uh, uh, kina written by, uh, by Elazar HaKalir. And this one is not that difficult to understand. It's a, it's a play on the word Echa, the opening word of the book of Echa, meaning how, but kind of dividing up the word Echa into two units, into a ko, a meaning where, and ko meaning thus or something like that. And where is the thus? Let's look at all the times in the Torah that the word ko appears attached to various promises given to the Jewish people. And what happened to all those ko's? A ko omer korat la'av befetzah. Where is that joy laden, laden promise? God made to the patriarch Abraham by the utterance of ko, when God said to him, ko yiyez arecha, the covenant between the pieces when God said, ko yiyez arecha, that your descendants will be numerous forever, and yet now my bones are destroyed through murder. Bul u atzamai beretz. Like you see, there's also an alphabetical acrostic here, omer in the first line, bul u in the third line. And then again, uh, part of Kalir's virtuosity. Every stanza here in this, uh, in, in this kina finishes with a phrase from Psalm 74 from Tehillim Perak Ayin Dalad, which is a, a, a Perak of lament, a chapter of lament, of complaint that begins Why have you forsaken us forever? Lama Elohim Zanachta. And then 
Kalir goes through the Torah basically in order, looking at all the Kohs and saying, what happened to all those Kohs? I'm, I'm just giving you a, a, a few of them. What became of the utterance of, the, of, uh, of Ko when Abraham drew Isaac near as a lamb for the burnt offering in order to do your will? And when Abraham said, I and the land will go, Ko, uh, what happened to that? Remember what Abraham did, but now your beloved one is pierced in halves. Some of the commentators say that this is uh, referring to like breaking a pomegranate open. Why does your anger smoke against the flock of your pasture? You know, there are all these promises that you made and you made them with ko. I'm saying echa because I'm saying, where is that ko? Uh, what became of the utterance of ko when good was sent to redeem your services. Eko tov keshulach ge'ol Why does, uh, why does Kalir refer to Moshe as tov? Well, there is a Midrash that says, Vatera uh, oto ki tov, who when Moshe was born, uh, uh, his mother saw that she was good. There's a Midrash that says that she named, that his original name was good. Uh, Moshe is the name that Pharaoh's daughter gave to him, but maybe his original name was tov, why does uh, Kalir use that Midrash here? Because he needs a tet. Uh, he, he needs for Moshe's name to begin with the letter tet. So, uh, but anyways, uh, God turned to Moshe and said to him, Ko tomar uh, el paro shalach et ami. And, you know, and then Moses went and did this. And we, we followed the instructions. God, what happened to that cope? But now treacherous men dwell in the house of your meeting. Your enemies roar in the midst of your place of assembly. Uh, okay, so what do we see in this poem? We see the Jewish concept of the plaintive prayer of uh, complaining to God and saying to him, why did you do what you did? So th this is, uh, it, it, it's not just like, just like the book of Echa, it isn't a book of consolation, and it isn't a poem that is looking at our sins. It's, it's approaching God with, uh, with a complaint. And many of our, uh, uh, many of our keynote fall into that category. Not all of them. And we'll see that uh, Kalir writes keynote of this kind, but he also writes keynote where he is looking to find what the sins of the Jewish people are. This is from his kina called Echa Yashva Chavatzelet HaSharon. And he writes, I'll read it in English, the fivefold Torah cried bitterly when a priest and a prophet was slain on Yom Kippur. Remember this line, we're gonna talk about this line. That a priest and a prophet was slain on Yom Kippur and because of his blood, young priests were slaughtered like goats and the priests of Tzipori strayed like birds. Uh, again, re re reference to the various shifts of, uh, of Kohanim, one of which uh, came from the city of Tsipori in the in, in the Galilee. So he, here we've got a different approach of Kalir, where he's looking to find what kind of sins there were uh, that, that the Jews did that explain what was happening. I, I just go, referring back to Echa for a second. I said that uh, you know Echa doesn't have a clear theological explanation. Echa does say uh, a number of times things like chet chata Yerushalayim, Jerusalem has sinned, but going into details of finding what the sins were that caused, uh, uh, that caused the destruction, that doesn't happen in Echa, except possibly in one verse, which we will talk about again in the continuation. But again, here in this kina, uh, uh, Kalir finds first the sin, a priest and a prophet was slain on Yom Kippur, but then he starts uh, 
listing other sins. On account of the sin of tithes and the sabbatical year, the bedecked bride was exiled from her land and was judged with four kinds of punishments. And the shift, the mishmeret of harim mifsheta, was stripped bare of her uh, 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 adornments. Hufsheta, mifsheta, a play on words about how this, uh, this shift of kohanim lost it. And why? Because the Jews did not observe the laws of tithes and of the sabbatical year correctly. Another uh, attempted explanation of the sin, they mocked those sages who fought for the sake of the Torah when they disregarded their plea to share bread with the hungry, and they themselves became hungry and thirsty from lack of bread and water when the two loaves in the temple were canceled. So again, another sin that was, uh, that was found here, that uh, the, the Jews were told to give money to charity, to give money to the poor and the hungry. They didn't do it, and that's why they were, uh, and, and that's why they were punished. Uh, recall the time when Israel responded, we will do and we will hear, na'aseh v'nishma, but now, in the days of the uh, destruction of the Second Temple, they no longer agree even to answer Amen Bata, Anot Amen Lo Avu. That there were good times in the past when the Jewish people said, Naaseb Nishma, but now he said, in the days, at the end of the days of the Second Temple, they wouldn't even answer Amen. Uh, the, and, and so this is the explanation of why they are suffering. They are sated and saturated with wormwood and gall, and the priests of Elbu are loathed and mocked. Again, a reference to one of the Mishmarot, one of the shifts of the Kohanim. So we have these two kinds of poems from Kalir, one of them complaining to God, and one of them, in a sense, complaining to the Jewish people and saying to the Jewish people, uh, you should consider that which you have done that led to this destruction. Uh, the first line there that I told you to bear in mind when a priest and a prophet was slain on Yom Kippur, Kenherag, Kohen, Venavi, Biyom Kippurim, is a reference to an interpretation of one of the verses in Echa. See, O Lord, and behold, to whom you have done this. Re'e Hashem v'habita l'mi olal tako. Im tochalna nashim piryam. Now, the English translation that I gave you at the bottom of the page here is from is the JPS translation. Alas, women eat their own fruit, their newborn babies. It's an awful description that the, uh, the, the, the hunger in, in Jerusalem was so great that when a baby died, the... the uh, Mother would, uh, would eat the baby to try to keep herself alive. And then, alas, priest and prophet are slain in the sanctuary of the Lord. It's a passive form there, are slain. Yeha reik. So it isn't clear who it is who is killing the Kohen or the, and the Navi. Is it the Jews, that's one interpretation of this text, or is this, is the last line here, priest and prophet are slain in the sanctuary of the Lord, is that part of the lament, or is that part of the sin? Is that a description of the sin of the Jewish people who killed a Kohen Benavi, or is it a part of the author of Echa saying, just think of all the terrible things that happened that Kohanim and Nevi'im, who were in the temple, in the sanctuary of the Lord, were killed. So, uh, of course, uh, Kalir is alluding to the Talmudic understanding of, the, uh, of this, and this is in the famous passage in Gitin, in the Agadot HaChurban, uh, I'll, I'll read it in English just to save time. Rabbi Yoshua ben Korcha said, an old man from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem related to me in this valley that lies before you, Nebuzar Radan, this is in the days of the destruction of the first temple, captain of the guard of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar killed 2,110,000 people. And then they expand on this. Nebuzar Radan found the blood of Zechariah, the son of Yehoyada, the priest, 
and saw that it was bubbling up from the ground. He saw some blood on the ground that was bubbling. And he said, what is this? Those in the temple said to him, it's sacrificial blood that had been poured there. He brought some animal blood and compared it to the blood bubbling up from the ground and he saw that they were not the same. Compared human blood with animal blood. Nebuzaradan said to them, if you tell me whose blood this is, it will be well for you. But if not, I will comb your flesh with iron combs. They said to him, what shall we say to you? He was a prophet among us who used to rebuke us about heavenly matters and we rose up against him and we killed him. They said, well, actually there was this prophet and we killed him. And uh, that's why the blood is bubbling here because it's the blood of that prophet. And for many years now, his blood has not settled. Nebuzaradan said to them, I will appease Zechariah. Zechariah must want revenge. So I'm going to give Zechariah his revenge. He brought the members of the great Sanhedrin, of the lesser Sanhedrin, and he killed them alongside the bubbling blood, but it still did not settle. He then brought young men and virgins and killed them alongside it, and it still did not settle. He then brought school children and killed them alongside it, but it still did not settle. Finally, Nevu Zaradan said to the blood, Zechariah, Zechariah. It's a beautiful scene here, Nevu Zaradan addressing the blood by name. I have killed the best of them. Do you want me to destroy them all? When he said this, the blood at last settled. So that's, that's the story as it appears in Gitin about the blood here. And as uh, at that moment, the, there's a happy ending to the story. Nebu Zaradan contemplated the idea of repentance and said to himself, if for the death of one soul, that of Zechariah, God punishes the Jewish people in this manner, then that man, meaning himself, who has killed all of these souls, all the more so will I be subject to great punishment from God. He fled and he sent to his house a document detailing what was to be done with his property and he converted to Judaism. And according to another Talmudic uh, passage, uh, descendants of Nevu Zaradan became great Torah scholars, if I remember correctly, it's Rabbi Meir, the Tana, who is uh, reputed to be a descendant of Nevu Zaradan. So that's the, uh, the attempt of the Gemara in Gitin to find a story. It, it, I find this an extremely disturbing story, and I, I, I assume that most people do. Uh, do uh, all of these people are dying because, they, because Zaharia wants revenge. And just remembering again, it all goes back to the question of how to interpret this verse here. Alas, women eat their own fruit. Alas, prophet and priest are slain in the sanctuary of the Lord. But this Midrashic interpretation actually does have some basis in a biblical text, and that's in the second book of, uh, of uh, Chronicles in Debrei Amim Bet. The story is told about the death of a prophet in the temple. The Spirit of God enveloped Zechariah, the son of Yehoiada, the priest, and he stood above the people and he said to them, thus God said, why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord when you cannot succeed? Since you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. So he gave the standard message the prophets give to the Jewish people that as they observe God's law, all will go well with him, with them. Uh, but they would not listen. They conspired against him, and they pelted him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord by the order of the king. So the king, who was King Yoash, uh, who, as we will see in the continuation here, had actually been helped by Zechariah's father at one at the beginning of his uh, of his career. The king said, "Let's kill that Zechariah," and they and they killed him. Uh, and the Debrei Amim goes on to say, King Yoash disregarded the loyalty that his father Yehoiada had shown to him, and he killed his son. And as he was dying, he said, Yere Hashem v'yidrosh. May the Lord see and requite it. So we do have the story in Debrei Amim Bet of a prophet 
dying, not at the end, but actually in the middle of the days of Bayit Rishon, the, of the first temple. And the Midrash builds on this. And it's possible that the line in Echa uh, that says, Migdash Hashem Kohen Navi is a reference uh, to this. Uh, and the amazing line here that as he died, he was looking for revenge. May the Lord see and requite it. Now on the shot level, the revenge comes actually in the next verse. He said when he was being killed, Yere Hashem v'yidrosh, I'd like the people who killed me to get punished. And in the next pasuk, in the next verse, they do get punished. At the turn of the year, the army of Aram marched against them. They invaded Judah and Jerusalem, and they wiped out all the officers of the people from among the people, and they sent all the booty they took to the king of Damascus. So on the pshat level, it, it's not that the uh, Sefer Divrei Amim is saying that there is this... Uh, blood that has never been uh, been avenged and that has to be avenged. Uh, but the Gemara picks up on that in the, in the almost desperate attempt to find a reason why the destruction took place. So we grab on to a half of a verse or a quarter of a verse in the book of Echa that might be a reference to this, uh, to, to, to this story from Second Chronicles in order to explain uh, what was happening. Um, the, the story appears in another kina of Kalir, and the kina, Im Tochalna Nashim, there's a whole kina that is dedicated to, that begins with the image of women eating their own children who have died. And that whole kina is like a complaint. God, how, how did you allow something like this to happen? And then at the end, uh, Kalir writes, the Ruach HaKodesh Lemul'am Mar'im, the Holy Spirit thunders against them. Woe to the wicked of the Jewish people. They inform others about what has befallen them, but they do not inform others about what they have done. They give voice to the fact that women eat their own children, but to the fact that they killed a prophet and a priest in the temple, they do not give voice. So at least in the Korean translation of the Hebrew that you have on the left here in this slide, we have this attempt to balance that, that, that uh, it's okay to complain about what God has done to the Jewish people, but there also should be some understanding that the Jewish people did not uh, behave properly. As I was putting this uh, class together, I noticed that actually there are two extremely different translations of that last paragraph there, and they depend on how you understand that last line, im yehareg b'migdash Hashem kohen v'navi. And here are the two different translations, the Rosenfield translation and the Korain translation of this text. So the Korain we already read. I'll read it one more time. The Holy Spirit thunders against them. Woe to the wicked of the Jewish people. They inform others about what has befallen them, but do not inform others about what they have done. They give voice to the fact that women eat their own children, but to the fact that they killed a prophet and a priest in the temple, they do not give voice. So that's the Korean translation. Rosenfield understands this text totally differently. The Holy One thunders his anger exclaiming, woe to all my bad neighbors. That's actually, if you look at the Hebrew there, I'll call Shechenai Haraim. That's, that's what it says there. But who are these Shechenai Haraim? So Korain says, oh, Shechenai Haraim must be the wicked from the Jewish people. Rosenfield says, no, this means the bad neighbors of the Israelites. Woe to all my bad neighbors. They announced the fate which they brought upon Israel, but what they themselves committed, they do not announce. 
when women are forced to eat their own offspring, they proclaim the scandal. But when they themselves slay a priest and a prophet in the sanctuary of the Lord, they do not publish it. Who is, Rosenfield thinks that, Kalir thinks that the killing of the Kohen Venavi is being done by the enemies of the Jewish people. These are these bad uh, neighbors of the Jewish people. They gloat over the fact that the Jews have been reduced to eating their own children, but they don't admit that they committed atrocities when they entered the temple and they killed priests and prophets. So this might be yet another example of the difficulty of Kalir's poetry that at the end of his poem, where he seems to be trying very hard to make a clear statement, we have two very different understandings. Is he talking about the sin of the Jewish people or is he talking about the thin, sin of the enemies of the Jewish people? Um, I wanted to finish off with a different, uh, with a different kina that wasn't written by Kalir. In, in all of the collections of Kinot, in the Korean edition, in the Rosenfield edition, uh, in the Goldschmidt edition, it says, Mechaber uh, lo yadua. We don't know who wrote this. A uh, professor, Israel Levin, has recently argued that it was written by Ibn Ezra. And I think that it is possible. I, I, I haven't read all of uh, Professor Levin's uh, arguments about this, but I think that it's possible that uh, the, the, the style of this poem, so Ibn Ezra didn't like the poems that Khalir wrote at all, and he didn't like the poems that Khalir wrote for, uh, that Khalil wrote uh, for Tisha B'Av in particular, and so he wrote his own. And the, this poem alternates with lines that finish B'tseti mi Mitzrayim and B'tseti mi Rushalayim. It's a contrast of Jewish history, of the high points of Jewish history and the low points of Jewish history. This is what life was like for the Jewish people when I left Egypt. And this is what life is like for the Jewish people when I left Jerusalem. Notice the first person singular. We're all used to this from, uh, from the Seder, from the Haggadah. Uh, that every person should think of himself or herself as if they were the ones who left Egypt. But this poet, Ibn Ezra or whoever it is, says that we should see ourselves, feel as if I left Egypt and feel as if I left Jerusalem. I had the uh, pleasure this morning of uh, listening on Zoom to uh, my daughter, Hannah Lakshan Bob, introducing uh, keynote to her shul in, uh, in, in Modi'in. Uh, and she pointed out that uh, Professor uh, Yosef Yerushalmi in his book, uh, Zahor, talks at length about this poem as an example of why Jews were interested in history. They, they weren't interested in history in, in the sense that, 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 that so many uh, historians and students of history are today, but they were interested in history because they, they felt that it, it was their history. I left Egypt. I left Jerusalem, and th that's what we're supposed to be feeling. And so the poet Ibn Ezra, or whoever it is, says here, a fire burns within me when I recall when I left Egypt, but I invoke lamentation to remember when I left Jerusalem. The waves of the sea raised themselves and stood erect as a wall when I left Egypt. The flow flooded me, overflowing my head when I left Jerusalem. Looking for images here, images of water uh, here, that, that uh, water was part of our salvation when we left Egypt, and water was part of our destruction when we left 
Jerusalem. Sacrifices, meal offerings, and anointing oil when I left Egypt, but God's treasure led away like sheep to the slaughter when I left Jerusalem. We were bringing korbanot, we were bringing sacrifices when we left Egypt, or we at least were told how to bring sacrifices when we left Egypt, but then we became the sacrifice. We became the sheep taken to the slaughter when we left, uh, when we left uh, Jerusalem. Jubilee and sabbatical years and a tranquil uh, land when I left Egypt, but I was sold in perpetuity, forever severed when I left Jerusalem. One of the reasons that I think, I don't know whether you saw, Professor Levin said this in his argument uh, about why he attributes this to Ibn Ezra, every word in this poem is a biblical Hebrew word. And the, 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 Ibn Ezra is extremely careful to use biblical Hebrew in his writing. There's one exception. I, I, I only give you selections here. The name Hadrian, uh, the emperor Hadrian appears in the uh, poem at one point. That's the not, that's, that's one ver word in this poem that isn't a biblical Hebrew uh, word. Uh, again, the, uh, the poet wants us to, uh, to remember the good times, of the, the, the great times, the wonderful times of Jewish history, and also the bad times of Jewish history. Shulchan um nora v'chalil uktora b'tzeti mi mitzrayim v'elil v'toeva u'fesel matzeva b'tzeti mi rushalayim. The table, the menorah, burnt offerings and incense when I left Egypt, but idols, abominations and graven images when I left Jerusalem. You know, what, what are the props that we had uh, when we left Egypt? And what were the props that we had when we left Jerusalem? We were taken out into this uh, world of idolatry. And then the end of the poem is, Torah utuda uchle hachemda b'tzeti mimitzrayim. The Torah and its message and precious vessels when I left Egypt. Sason v'simcha, v'nas yagon v'anacha, v'shuvi l'irushalayim. Happiness and joy, gone are sorrow and sighing when I return to Jerusalem. And uh, sitting here in Jerusalem, <laughs> uh, thinking about uh, returning to, uh, to Jerusalem, I, I, I'm very uh, uh, pleased to finish off this discussion of keynote with a uh, with a message of hope, which is the structure. Whoever put together the collection of keynote put this and other hopeful ones towards the end of the collection of keynote. So if you ever decide to recite keynote and you're only going to take a few of them, be sure to take some from towards the end because the, uh, the, the, there is a progression in the collection of keynote from the less hopeful ones to the more hopeful ones. And I uh, will stop sharing screen and be able to see uh, more of you. And uh, Thank you. Uh, Rabbi Kelman, do you want to yes. uh, pass on to me some of the- Sure, uh, questions? some of the questions. Okay, the beginning people were asking you mentioned they, the Tanaim didn't talk about what the Romans. So somebody raised a question, maybe out, out of fear, they were still living on the Roman world where some say why, why Hilchot fill in and stuff isn't in, in the Mishnah, etc. cetera. Um, so then another comment from a former Torontonian uh, that perhaps the, the Midrashim on Shemot and Pesach are projecting really um, the current events onto what happened and they just, they, they coded it, which Midrash does a lot. I don't know if you want to comment. 
I think you agree with both of those comments. I agree, yes. Uh, Rabbi Kelman knows me well. Yes, I think that those are both excellent, uh, uh, excellent comments. They were living under occupation. They were living under the Tanaim, were living here in Eretz Yisrael under an extremely cruel occupation of the Romans. How openly could they speak about it? That's, uh, that's, uh, that's very true. And, and when I mentioned those books that Professor Price had mentioned a few hours ago and that the lecture that I heard, Fourth Ezra, second Baruch, third Baruch, where Jews were writing about that. They were writing about it in code. They weren't saying the Romans did thus and such. They, 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 were, uh, they, they were writing as if, some of them were writing as if it was about the destruction of the second temple, of the first temple, but wink, wink, of course it was about the destruction of the, uh, 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 of the second temple. And most of those writers that I, uh, that I mentioned and that, per, that I, uh, that I heard of, uh, Professor Price uh, talking about, they were still interested in fighting the Romans. And it's not clear that the it, it's possible that the uh, Rabban Yohanan ben Sakai approach of, uh, of saying, we got to save whatever we can save. We shouldn't be fighting against them was the, uh, was the winning kind of uh, approach. And yes, is it possible they were talking about that the rabbis were also talking about it in code and uh, Arami Oveda V and really it's Roma E Oveda V? Distinctly possible. Yes. Okay, just you know, quickly because we want to you know stay on pace. Somebody commented even Ezra uh, did the same thing. He wrote in code, of course, when he had his I don't know if you want to call it you know Adayamazad those type of comments, which for good reason, as another Torontonian points out um, here. And um, a very interesting comment at the end, um, that even as you're leaving Spain for England, because he thought to teach the people proper Hebrew, that their language was very good, and he had to go and teach them. So he had this, this sensitivity to this um, idea. Um, oh, yes. Hebrew was very important to uh, Ibn Ezra. Those of you who know me know that it's kind of important to me too. But right. uh, I, I don't think that I'm as much a Meshugala Davar as Ibn Ezra was. He was so upset, uh, both when he was living in northern France and when he was in England, to see that, uh, that, that those Ashkenazim didn't really understand Hebrew uh, properly the way, uh, the way Spartan did. Yes. Okay, it's, uh, it's 2.57. I want to give people a three-minute break to stretch. I want to thank you again. We look forward to learning with you, you know, in the future. And uh, nice having you as always. And uh, you can go finish your meal. I presume you ate most of it before. But, I, you know, we interrupted the meal, in the, you know, after a few minutes. So uh, thank you very much, on, uh, as always. Okay.